Good evening and welcome. It's good to see each of you. Any of you folks ever been to Paris? Could I see your hands? Look at the hands. Yes, yes, and yes, you've been to Paris. Any of you ever wanted to go to Paris? No? Yeah, many of you did. All right. We're going to London tonight. <laughs> Would you fast your seatbelts as the lights go down, please? If you've been to London, you're going to appreciate and enjoy this as well, I know. It seems that, um, that everyone who has been there has wanted to go back. And I think the major reason is that uh, she's our mother and we share a common language along with a common governmental style, at least to a large degree. Let's then begin to look around the city of London, shall we? We're going to cross the English Channel from Ostend in Belgium. It'll take us about three and a half hours on this propeller-driven ship, and the water is rough, and that's going to slow us down some. The waters of the English Channel are among the most violent in all this world. The water of the Channel really operates more like, well, more like a river than it does an ocean. It comes from the North Sea, to the north, of course, and then flows in a southerly direction until it dumps into the Atlantic Ocean down in the south. The waters of the channel are most violent during May and June. Winds can come suddenly and without warning, and back before we had uh, all kinds of weather technology, it caused many a fisherman to go down into the depths. Some of you folks probably know as well that now there is a tunnel beneath the English Channel. Always before, you had to cross the water in a boat, and then they came with a hydrofoil, which was more like an aeroplane really than a boat. It has fans that, flowed, that blow down on the water and literally lift the ship up until it's four or five feet above the water, and then it has propellers to drive it just like a propeller-driven airplane. And when it leaves the tarmac on the one side of departure, uh, you're on dry ground, and when it stops on the other side, you get out on dry ground as well. But we're making this crossing, as I've mentioned, on a regular prop-driven ship, and it takes us, depending on the weather and the conditions, three and a half to four hours. We're going over to Calais, over to the area of the White Cliffs, from Calais, I should better say, in France, over to the White Cliffs of Dover. The White Cliffs, folks, are really nothing more or less than the sand hills that have been washed away by the constant pounding of the waters of the English Channel. We're going to disembark here and get aboard the train, a train that will in just a few minutes really take us in to the city of London. The major cities of the world were born on the banks of a river. In Paris, it's the Seine, and in another city or something else, here it is the River Thames. I, by the way, shall never forget the first time I came to the city of London, I was in a train car, and in that same compartment with me were two ladies who were natives to the city, and as we crossed the River Thames in the train car, one of them fairly jumped out of her seat and said, Oh, look, look, now you can see the beautiful River Thames. Well, if I'd been born and raised in the city, I know I would have felt just like she felt, but I had a little bit of a different feeling. I know that I've seen more beautiful rivers, the Yakima and certainly the Columbia and the one that runs by your house as well. Let's have a little bit of a close-up here as we look at this panoramic view of the city. I want to use my pointer to take you right to the very center of the picture. There it is. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the dome to the largest Anglican cathedral in all the world. It's the second largest cathedral because St. Peter's over in the Vatican is first, but it is the second largest. It's an Anglican. It is really kind of the, the mother church of the Anglican communion. And here, of course, in the United States, we call it Episcopalian. Now I'll take your minds back uh, many years and you'll remember when a beautiful, beautiful girl by the name of Diana married the prince. Prince Charles, Lady Diana, were married 
inside that beautiful, beautiful cathedral. The architect of the cathedral was a man by the name of Christopher Wren. And if you want to read an interesting biography, go to your library, or perhaps you can pull up the information off the Internet. Read a biography or two of Christopher Wren. He's buried in the basement area of the cathedral, and the tomb, the sarcophagus in which he's buried, is very, very lovely in its own right. Peggy and I had the happy privilege to be in the city of London when the London Philharmonic was playing and the London City Choir was singing together with him and it happened in this church and we had front row seats. One of the great musical thrills of my life, next, I guess, to being at the Grand Old Opry. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. Well, there's more to see. If you have not a lot of either time or money, a good way to see the City of London is to get aboard one of these double-deck buses. You want to be sure to get up in the top there and get a side seat, a window seat, and your driver will also be your guide. He'll have one of those little microphones around his ear and by his mouth, and he'll drive you around and show you the major sights and uh, explain to you what happened here and what happened there. And one thing that I recall so very well from my visit, and this is related to what we're going to talk about from the Bible in a little bit, he took us to the place where the bubonic plague broke out. That horrible, horrible illness, that disease that we now know was spread from fleas to rats to people. And the people died here by the hundreds and then by the thousands and then by the tens of thousands. A good place to catch a tour bus, and you see one over on the right-hand side, is here at Piccadilly Circus. Now, from my high school years, I had read about Piccadilly Circus, and I thought somehow that... It was a place where you went to see lions and tigers and clowns and big circus tents. And of course, it's not that at all. It's a traffic circle. The word circus is from the word circle and vice versa, from the Latin. And this is a main hub of traffic downtown, from the center of which the boulevards go off like the spokes of a wheel. Piccadilly Circus. It also happens to be a gathering place for the young adults young teenagers and folks in their early 20s perhaps, and single largely, and they gather here and they tell their friends, newly met, where they have been and what they've seen and, and the cheap places to stay, and um, from there they spread out to, um, to see the sights of this city and then to other places in the world as well. We're going to stop briefly and pay our respects at the tomb of the British unknown soldier. The group that I was with had made prior arrangements to stop and take a wreath of flowers over to the tomb of the British unknown, and I shall never forget that experience as well. We mentioned a bit ago that we're related to the folks over in England um, in many, many ways, politically and, uh, and because that's really our birth mother in the sense of our language and a lot of other ways. And so we have been friends, more than that, we have been companions on nearly every major battlefield for the last 200 years, haven't we? All right? So we pay our respects at the tomb of the unknown. Now, not so very far away is perhaps the second most famous address in all of the city of London. Everyone that goes wants to go see where the queen lives, and of course I was able to do that. Buckingham Palace and, and then some of the palaces on the perimeter I was able to tour as well. But second to the place of the royals, folks want to go to number 10 Downing. Who lives at number 10 Downing Street? The Prime Minister, that's exactly right. When I first went to the city, they would allow you to go right up to the front door and visit with the bobbies that stood guard at the front door. Of course, you can't do that now. There's where my buddies and I were doing it, having a little chat with the bobbies and asking if the prime minister was home and, and what he liked for breakfast. But because of terrorism and all of that, you have to get a picture like this with a telephoto lens from more than a block and a half away. What terrorism has done to the world is, uh, is very tragic, isn't it? And we've uh, 
we've not seen the worst of it yet, I'm afraid. Now nearby, we're going to stop at Whitehall, the military academy. The military academy where those who guard the royals are trained. It's been in the world news of late <clears throat> that uh, Prince Harry was um, on the ground at a certain battlefield recently and, and in harm's way and, and he had to be brought home because it got leaked and you know all of that that goes along with it. Well, the guards that guard him, not only on the battlefield but when he's at home or in the area, are trained here. Those who guard the queen and the, the prince are trained right here at Whitehall, the military academy. Next, we're going to stop at a church that I believe to be one of the most famous in all the world, not because of its architecture, not because of its size, but rather because of the men who have pastored this church, one in very particular. He's like so many of the Brits. He has four names, John R.W. Stott, S-T-O-T-T. -T. Now, when you go to the Christian bookstore and you find his books or you're able to buy his recordings, do that. They'll be a great blessing to you. I had read his books. I had listened to him by way of tape, and I wanted so very, very badly to be able to meet him. I knew that if I would get a seat in his church, I would have to get there early because while the majority of the Christian churches in and around the city and the surrounding areas are largely empty on worship day, this church is packed to the rafters, packed until often there's not even standing room. And so I left my overnight place at about 9 the next morning, got aboard the subway. They over there, of course, call it the underground. Got off at Piccadilly, which is only a block or two from here. And then I double time. I jogged right on down. From half a block away, I could see that there was already a line in front of the door. More than that, I noticed that there were television trucks with the big satellite antennas and all of the rest. Something special was happening. I stood in that line for 10 or 12 minutes, and when it didn't move, I snuck around to the side door and attempted to sneak in. But there I was met by a very able deacon, and he said, I'm sorry, sir, we have no room. We're already full. Now, this is just a little after 9 o'clock. I played to his sympathies. I said, sir, I have come all the way from the United States. I'm a preacher, and I want so very much just to hear in person Pastor Stott speak. Well, sir, he said, I'm sorry on two counts then. Firstly, he said, we have no room, not even standing room. Perhaps later I may find you a place. But secondly, and more importantly, even if I can find you a place, you can't hear Pastor Stott. He's not in residence at all today. He said, matter of fact, one of your chaps is filling our pulpit today. Now, whom do you folks think, what preacher would come from the United States over to this very famous church and fill it to capacity by 9 o'clock? Whom do you think it was, huh? Who said Jim Baker? I heard you people. <laughs> come on now. Now, it was Billy Graham indeed. And after a bit, the deacon came to me and he said, I found you a spot, sir. And it was right up front. And I was seated and I heard Dr. Billy Graham present a message on the shepherd's psalm that I think I shall never forget. And afterward, I had the privilege to shake his hand. And that's my claim to fame. I had to wait another eight years in order to meet and hear John Stott. I was working in the city of Birmingham, Alabama, when he came to the Baptist University there, Saver University, and he taught a class for two weeks on preaching, and I had the privilege to audit his class. I sat at his feet, had lunch with him one day, and told him the story that I've just told you about going all that way to meet him and hearing Dr. Billy Graham. Well, we're going to stop next at the place of Trafalgar. Trafalgar Square is also dedicated to the war dead of the British armies and Navy, more particularly, and atop that column that you see in the very center is a statue of Lord Nelson. 
British Admiral Lord Nelson, who led the British fleet out onto the high seas when their enemies fought them there with an armada much larger than that of the British, their enemies, the French and the Spanish combined together. And it was in that battle of Trafalgar that Lord Nelson was gravely wounded, but hid his wounds so that his soldiers would fight bravely on. And so he's honored here in Trafalgar Square. Now we're going to pause at the place of lawmaking for the British. These are the halls of Parliament. Now, how many of you folks have ever been to one of the halls or perhaps both the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C.? Could I see your hands? Yeah, many, many of you have been. I have been there. I lived and worked out of Washington, D.C. for three years. There is generally a sense of decorum. Some call it southern gentility, southern politeness. And the speaker will say, the lady from California now will speak. The gentleman from Louisiana now has the floor. And there is this politeness. With all due respect, someone will say in answer, you see, over here it's quite different. Someone stands up to speak and about half of the folks out there say, boo, down with the bugger. Let the lady sit down, boo. <laughs> it's really bad, but they seem to get their job done nonetheless. The halls of parliament. And here also we find, I suppose, the most famous clock in all the world. There it is. It was Roger Miller, Miller the country singer and writer who immortalized it, I guess, for all time when he composed and sang that little ditty, England swings like a pendulum do. Bobby's on bicycles two by two, Westminster Abbey and the Tower of Big Ben and the rosy red cheeks of the little children. England swings. Now this you probably already knew. Almost every grandfather clock and almost every grandmother clock has the chimes that are patterned after the chimes of the Tower of Big Ben. So the next time your grandfather clock goes off, you'll remember this, won't you? I'm sure you will. We come now to a cathedral that is a thousand years old, ladies and gentlemen. Instead of a place of worship, it's become more of an archive. It has become a burial ground for some very, very famous people. Nearly every member of the royal family, and by that I mean the kings and queens, not uh, their children and, and grandchildren, but the kings and queens from the time of William the Conqueror even till the recent time have been buried inside here. In addition to the royals, there for instance is Poets' Corner, where in crypts you'll find the tombs of Keats and Shelley and Byron and so forth. Uh, Samuel Johnson, perhaps the greatest speaker and writer in all of the English language, is honored inside here. But I want to take your minds to a couple of things. Firstly, the architecture. The architecture here is Gothic. And I happen to feel it's one of the most beautiful examples of Gothic architecture. I remind you once more, it was built a thousand years ago. Now with that in mind, we're going to step inside and we're going to look up at the ceiling. Hand carved marble, ladies and gentlemen. Done not with power tools, but by men with hammers and chisels and crude sanding implements. I think they did a good job. What do you think? Now I'm going to take your minds to an event that happened here not so terribly long ago, Time goes by more rapidly than we young folks really relate to sometimes. At the time of the death of Princess Diana, her funeral was conducted here. And about where I'm standing to shoot this picture was the cataphlac upon which her casket was with uh, the little note from her sons, William and Harry, goodbye mom. You remember her own brother eulogized her from nearby. Now, we're going to go, you and I together, around behind the high altar, and we're going to notice something that is of importance. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the seat of coronation. If and when Prince Charles becomes the King of England, he will sit in that chair, 
as the crown is placed upon his head and the scepter placed in his hand. But I want you to notice something beneath the chair. There has been made a shelf over the centuries right there. And inside that shelf, there is a great big rock. I suppose that thing weighs 200, 250 pounds. It has two names. It's called the Stone of Destiny, and it's also known as the Stone of Scone because it originated from Scone, Scotland. For hundreds of years before ever it was brought here and placed beneath the seat of coronation, the Scottish kings sat upon it while they were crowned. And then the British got hold of it and decided it'd be a good place for, for them to show it off here beneath their own seat of coronation. And a few years ago, some enterprising Scots got inside this cathedral. That's not so difficult. But they got this rock from out the, uh, from the, under the chair, and I don't know, it must have taken two or three of them just to carry it, or maybe they, maybe they had a, a suitcase uh, uh, that uh, they uh, tried to make believe they had camera equipment. I don't know how they did it, but they got it out, and they got it clear back up to Scotland, and they had it for about three days before it was discovered missing. And when the folks from England discovered it was missing, they had a fit. I mean, they were ready to shed blood. And the Scots said, we're not going to fight over a rock. Have it back. And so under heavy escort, they brought it back and replaced it here. But now the rest of the story. A few months ago, the government here said, look, it was your rock. It belongs to you. Have it back. <laughs> You'd think someone was tired of hauling the thing back and forth, wouldn't you? But if you're going to see the thing now, they tell me you must go to Edinburgh in Scotland. The stone of scone, the stone of destiny. Now we've come, ladies and gentlemen, to 47 City Road. We've come to the church that was the last place of preaching of a man who's become my indoor sport. A man whom I feel was one of the greatest Christians ever to live since the time of the Bible writers and authors, Paul and Titus and Timothy, originator of a Christian movement that changed the world. His name, John Wesley. John Wesley was born into the home of a nonconformist preacher. That means he didn't go along with some of the teachings of the Anglican church. And because of his disagreements theologically, he was disallowed preaching inside any Anglican church, for church and state were one and the same back in those days. He raised a family of 11 children along with his dear Christian wife, and almost without exception, each of those 11 children went into some form of ministry, preaching ministry, missionary ministry, medical ministry, and that to include the girls. When John and his brother Charles became eligible for college, they were granted scholarships over at the area of Oxford, Cambridge. They were made Oxford scholars. That meant as long as they chose to stay, their tuition was paid and their books were provided to them and they were given a living stipend. And they were scholars indeed, straight A students. It wasn't too very long after their arrival at the Oxford universities that the boys began to gather around themselves others of like mind with a love for Jesus. And they set a certain time every morning about sunrise to get up and have worship together. And then to study their Bibles together. And then, of course, there was schoolwork to be done. But they would also set a time during the day to go into the cities and visit the places of the poor, the indigent, the poor houses and the hospitals for the really poor folks and the orphanages. And then they would stand on street corners and speak of their love for Jesus. And then they would gather together again in the evening time, study together, pray together. And ere long, this group of young men became known disparagingly as the Methodists because of their methodical practice of the faith of Jesus. A time for this, a time for this, and a time for this. 
upon his graduation, John Wesley decided he wanted to go and be a missionary in some area where they'd never heard of Jesus Christ. So he got aboard the boat and came over to what is today Savannah, Georgia, and he began a ministry to Native Americans. John Wesley was small in stature. At best, they say, he stood about 4 feet and 11 inches, maybe 5 feet if he had heels on his shoes, but he was a Christian giant. There was a girl, native to the area of Savannah, Georgia, who was smitten with him. I mean, she fell head over heels in love with him. And she began to tell around that they were going to be married. John Wesley has asked me to be his wife. I'm going to be a pastor's wife. And when the word got back to John Wesley, he immediately put out the disclaimer. He said, not at all. He said, I I've never given this girl the slightest hint that I'm romantically inclined toward her. I've always been kind to her, respectful of her, but I have never, uh, never suggested anything of a romantic nature. No, we're not going to be married. A couple of days later, her daddy said, Oh, yeah? He said, we can either do it peacefully or you can do it in front of a shotgun, but you're not going to jilt my daughter. Oh, by the way, do you know what in Idaho we call a formal wedding? That's when you have a white shotgun. <laughs> and so John Wesley decided it was time to get out of a dodge. And so one night under the cover of darkness, he slipped out through the swamps filled with gators and poisonous snakes to Tybee Island. And there he caught the first boat that would take him back to London. And he began a ministry on the back of mules and horses that would take him a distance of over 300,000 miles. In his later years, they built for him this little church, uh, large by today's standards, but small by comparison to the standards of the great cathedrals. And the place was packed. John Wesley married the nurse of his third illness. Tragedy, he didn't marry the nurse of his first or second illness, but he made the mistake of marrying the nurse of his third illness. And it was not a marriage made in heaven. I mean, the kindest thing you can say about his wife is she was mean. <laughs> he was preaching from this church and in the pulpit one worship morning on the Ten Commandments. He said, you know, brother, sister, I've been accused of breaking each of the commandments except the one that says thou shalt not steal. I've never been accused of breaking that one. And his wife jumped up shouting in the middle of his sermon, John, that's a lie. Just last week you stole sixpence from my purse. And John Wesley said, well, brother, sister, I guess that completes the list. I mean, now... <laughs> one day... One of his students, a pastor in training, came here to the front door of his little parsonage. The door was open a bit, and he heard inside noise, a ruckus. Fearful that there was a robbery taking place or something, he pushed the door open and went right in, and he said there he found John Wesley's wife mopping the floor with the poor little guy, literally dragging him around by the hair of his head. For his safety's sake, John Wesley separated from his wife and spent his last years, about 11, quite alone here. He's buried around behind. I went around to his grave, and there I knelt. And there I prayed, Oh, God, give me the burden that you have given John Wesley and so many other your faithful Christians. Give me the burden. And may I be methodical, Methodist, in my love for Jesus Christ. Thank you for traveling with me tonight. There have been a couple of alarming stories as regards your health and mine in the last couple of days. I'm going to share them with you only just very briefly. It happened in Los Angeles. A man in a motel, not the best perhaps, but certainly not the worst, discovered a white powder. He called the police, and the police came thinking, first of all, that it was cocaine. And some sampled it and sniffed like they do cocaine and tasted it on their lips. The tragedy is it was ricin. 
that terrible poison, that deadly poison that's made out of the castor bean. It's assumed now that there is one that is at least uh, very critically ill and perhaps as many as 20 or 30 others whose outcome we're at this point unsure of. It was the same poison, you remember, that a few years ago was used in the subways over in Japan to take the lives of around 40 people. And then yesterday, there was the announcement that in the city of Las Vegas, a certain health clinic has been using hypodermic needles the, more than once. And I, I shouldn't say that I ought to qualify to say they're not using the same needle, but they're using the same vials and they're using the same plunger. And the sad news is that they believe now that there have been somewhere around 40,000 people that have been infected because of this with either hepatitis or the HIV virus or both. Disease going like wildfire in so many parts of the world, and the prophecies suggest that they're going to come to this part of the world as well. It was science fiction only just a few years ago. Some of you will remember it, the Andromeda strain and the fear uh, of a disease coming that would wipe out a great amount, a large number of the human race. And then there was the movie Medicine Man, played by Sean Connery, that was too sort of on the side of make-believe but more recently, there came the movie, some of you will remember, that was acted by Dustin Hoffman, and it was based on a true story of a disease that was traced to the jungle, a disease that could very easily come to our own shores and be spread like fire in dry grass. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 21. And let's read God's future, God's plan for His redeemed. Revelation chapter 21. We've said over and over again that the revelation is for those who live in the last days. And we're going to begin tonight with the really good news. Revelation chapter 21, beginning with the first verse and reading down through to the end of verse 4. Revelation 21, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Here in vision says, John, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven, the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And then I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven that said, Look, the tabernacle of God was, is with men. He's going to be with them and be their God. And then he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, it says in verse 4. And then there'll be no more death, there'll be no more sorrow, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. In the beginning, God created the world that was perfect. In the center of His perfect world, He placed a garden. In the center of the garden, He placed our parents, Adam and Eve. It was a perfect environment. In the end, we're going to return to the original. God's going to remake the earth. In the center of his remade earth, he's going to place the garden. In the center of the garden, he's going to invite his children to come and partake of the fruit of the various trees. In the beginning, they breathed fresh, clean air. They drank pure water. They had a vegetarian diet. And by the way, you folks may or may not know that where I come from, and that's Idaho, they call a vegetarian a man who cannot shoot. <laughs> now you know what I have to go through a little better, don't you now? Huh? All right. And so they had a very perfect environment. Pure air, pure water, the very best to eat, all vegetarian because there was no death. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, God said, There shall not hurt, be anything hurt or destroyed in all of my holy kingdom. I remember so very well a lady that Peggy worked with when she was going through college. This lady had as a child had a pet chicken. Any of you ever had a pet chicken? And not the average pet, but this lady had a pet chicken. And <laughs> she found it in dumplings one day. And from that time ever after, she couldn't even look at cooked chicken, let alone eat it. We're not going to have to worry about it in the earth made new. Not only did they have a perfect environment and good food and, and good clean air and water, they exercised. The Bible says they were involved in gardening. It was a life free of stress. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree called the tree of life, and they ate 
from that tree for their perpetual health. And then as we read on through Genesis, we come to chapter 3 and we find the devil coming, tempting our parents Adam and Eve with the forbidden fruit. They fail the test and then the earth is cursed. Thorns and thistles it shall produce. It says Genesis chapter 3 at about verse 18. And from that time there came weeds in the garden. Now I want you to listen very carefully to this. The further and further folks remove themselves from the Father, the greater and more dreadful the disease. The further folks remove themselves from the Father, the greater, more deadly the disease. And could I suggest to you that the same rule still applies till this very day? Now I want to read to you several scriptures. We're going to have to move quickly because we're going to go through a lot of really good Bible verses this evening. The next one is going to take us to Exodus chapter 15. So begin to turn there with me right now, if you will. Here is God's promise to His obedient children after the fall. This takes us to Moses leading the children of Israel out. Exodus chapter 15, and we're going to notice at verse 26. Genesis, and then Exodus chapter 15 at verse 26. God says this to His children that are going now from, from Egypt over into the Promised Land. God says, if you will diligently listen to my voice, and if you'll do that which is right in my sight, if you'll give an ear to my commandments and keep my statues, then I will put none of these diseases upon you which you knew in Egypt, for I, the Lord, have healed thee. That's good news, isn't it? Good news. God says, if you'll do what I say, if you'll follow my principles, if you'll know my example and be faithful to it, then I'm going to bless you in many ways, including good health. Down in Egypt, the folks had been accustomed to a diet that was not according to God's original plan. Moreover, they were accustomed to being involved in immorality, sexually, and promiscuity. And we know that from the evidence that has been unearthed in the tombs and in the tomb writings regarding the golden calf. We read about the folks building the golden calf while Moses is up on the mountaintop, and somehow we just follow the mistaken notion it was a simple matter of, well, they've kind of gone back to idolatry. But when the Old Testament says they rose up to play, it's talking about a sexual orgy. And so they had turned a long way from God and from His original plan in terms of diet and in terms of living the life that God had suggested that they lead and live. We're from here going to go to Jeremiah, Isaiah, and then Jeremiah chapter 30. And we're going to notice verse 17. And then we're going to go over a chapter or two and notice another verse. Jeremiah chapter 30, beginning down at verse 17. Jeremiah 30, 17. God says here in promise, I will restore health unto you. I will heal your wounds, says the Lord, because they have been called an outcast. I am the Lord of Zion who will take care of you. And that's from a modern translation. Now let's drop over, shall we, to chapter 30, Jeremiah chapter 30, and we're going to notice verse 7, I'm sorry, chapter 33. We were just at 30. Chapter 33, and we'll notice together verse 6, and it's very similar. Here's God's promise to His children as regards their being faithful to Him. Behold, I will bring forth health and cure, and I will cure my people, and I'll reveal unto them the abundance of my peace and my truth. Would you folks notice with me that good health and peace of mind comes at the point of following the truths of God? Jesus promised in John chapter 10 and the 10th verse, I have come that I might give you life and that more abundantly. Jesus said, if you live my way, I will bring to you an abundant life. And He will do that. I know He will. Now I want you to go with me, if you will, please, to 3 John. Not John's Gospel, those little Johnine letters right before the Revelation. And the third of them is very small. It's only just one chapter, and we're going to read verse 2. 3 John, the third little letter, and, well, let's read verses 1 and 2. Shall we do that? Let's read verses 1 and 2 of the third letter of John right before Jude and then Revelation. Here's what he says. 
the elder unto the well-believed beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, beloved, I wish above all things you might prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And so there again we see the plan of God given and spoken through Jesus to his servants of the New Testament. I want you to be happy and I want you certainly to be healthful as well. Now, in the last days, God says that there are going to be some serious medical difficulties in spite of modern medicine. And so I'm going to invite you with me, please, to transition. We're going to go to the last book, the Revelation, once more, and we're going to notice firstly at chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18, and we're going to read at verse 8. Revelation 18, verse 8, the last book for those who live in the last days. And this, by the way, has to do with the plagues. And the reference here is to spiritual Babylon. And that means all who have turned their backs on the clear truths of God's Word. To spiritual Babylon, there comes this warning. Chapter 18 of the Revelation and verse 8. Therefore, the plagues will come in one day. I'm going to pause here to remind some of you folks that in the Bible, when you're studying a passage that is clearly prophetic, you interpret that traditionally to mean a literal year. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14, where God has said repeatedly, I have given you a day for a year. And so New Testament scholars have said that we're to understand this in terms of its lasting for a literal year. The plagues will come in a year. There will be mourning, and there will be famine, and she shall be utterly burned, for strong is the Lord God who brings the judgment. Now, with that in mind, we're going to go to the sermon of Jesus on end time events. We refer to it nearly every evening. It's to be found in Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to read the seventh verse. Matthew chapter 24, to note especially tonight, verse 7. Matthew 24, 7. Here is Jesus' warning. You remember the context, and while you're turning, I'll just remind us once more. The disciples have said, Lord, what is it going to be like when you come back? Tell us so that we and our children and their children can be ready. And Jesus said it's going to be like this and this and this and this. And when you see these things happen, then know that the end is near. And so I take up the reading then, uh, chapter 24 of Matthew and the seventh verse, where Jesus said, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, I'm going to pause there for just a little bit to dovetail something that is not necessarily related, but I think will make a lot of sense to you. We talk about war and rumor of war being signs, and we think about this nation fighting with that nation and this country fighting against this country, and we could make tonight a long list of the wars that are going on between nations right now, and perhaps on another night we will take a careful look at that, but I want to share with you a little bit of the original language as it has to do with this passage. The word there that is translated as kindred against kindred. Nation against a kingdom against kingdom. The word is ethnos. Some of you A students are going to want to write it down. Ethnos. It's from that word that we have our word ethnic and ethnicity. What God is here saying is that in the last day, you're going to find a lot of folks that belong to the same race. They, they live in the same country, but the neighborhoods are at war. Do you see what we're saying now? Yeah. The, the Crips and the Bloods are fighting one against the other. Or the Hispanics are fighting against the blacks. Or they have divided up into gangs inside the prison. Ethnic groups warring against one another. And we're seeing that now, ladies and gentlemen, like we have never seen it in the history of mankind. And I think, again, that's one of the signs. Let's go beyond that. Nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences. And then it goes on to talk about earthquakes, and we've spent a good bit of time with that on other evenings. Pestilence. I've done my homework. The origin of the New Testament word pestilence is better translated as illness, disease, pandemic. And that all, by the way, comes from a man by the name of Webster, along with New Testament scholars. It comes from the New Testament word loimos, pestilence. HIV virus that becomes full-blown AIDS. 
since 1981, there have been more than 30 million deaths as the result of that disease alone. May I take your mind down to sub-Saharan Africa? 60% of the population in the sub-Saharan Africa have today AIDS. Only one in six of them get any medication at all, and there is no cure. Worse than AIDS, is it possible? It is. Dr. Dr. Michio Keku, a Ph.D. degree from City University of New York City, said, and I'm quoting, the viruses we now have in the making are much, much more deadly than any prior disease, including AIDS. Dr. Michael Osterholm from the Center of Infectious Diseases at the University of Minnesota said, and I quote, pandemics are like earthquakes, like hurricanes and tsunamis. They accrue. And he's getting back to this idea that we've shared before about the birth pangs, you know. At the time, uh, they, they get stronger, and at the, near the time of delivery, they're more intense, and they come closer and closer together. The birth pang syndrome. Now, listen up. New and more deadly. And this, by the way, was demonstrated by the movie in which Dustin Hoffman played the lead, E. coli and Ebola. And I'm going to read to you a little bit. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus is now one of the greatest, uh, greatest threats around the world. MRSA, we call it. And then we have also the threat of toxic shock that's growing. We have the flesh-eating, necrotizing fasciitis. We have the synergistic cellulitis. And then we also have SSSS, staph scalded skin syndrome. And it goes on and it gets worse. Then there are the airborne diseases, the touch contact uh, and your doctor, you may notice, stands back with very few exceptions. But the nurse, as we've also alluded, is the one that has the close-up personal contact with your vomit and with your other problems. Where are these diseases most likely to spread from? What's the most dangerous place? The stool in the public restroom? No. Is it the doorknob down at the restaurant? No. Though Lyle, by the way, now has a habit of opening nearly all public doors kind of like this. I was asked the other day if I'd lost a hand. I said, no, sir, and I don't want to lose my life either. What is the most likely place of you contracting a disease? The handle of the grocery cart in the grocery store. And that's why many of the stores now are providing that little towelette that they want you to all wipe your hand and then wipe the handle because that's where everybody grips and that's also where the sick kids hang on and drool. Be careful about the grocery cart at the grocery store. Disease warfare against man-made plagues. Now listen please and very carefully as we transition once again. Colonel Randall Larson, retired from the United States Air Force, now Director of Homeland Security. And I'm going to read you a short statement from him. Nature can be harsh... However, that which now really scares me are the man-made diseases. Dr. Sergei Popov from the National Center of Biodefense from the George Mason University. And by the way, he's the man who headed up the Soviet Union's disease projects. And he recently said, it is possible to take smallpox, one of the worst natural killers, and engineer it to become the final ultimate weapon. And then he went on to say that the recipe for doing this with smallpox is to be found out on the internet. Dr. Stephen Block, Ph.D. of biophysics, Stanford University of California said, and I quote, We've lived many, many decades with the threat of nuclear annihilation. Fortunately, however, only a few folks had access to the nuclear button. But what happens when we give that button to everybody? And he's talking, by the way, about the information that's so readily available out on the Internet. And then one more quotation briefly from a man who knows what he's talking about. His name is Dr. Robert Butterworth. He has a Ph.D. in trauma psychiatry and psychology. And he asks, 
Who would do such a thing? And he's talking about germ warfare and spreading these diseases that are manufactured in some government medical institution. Who would do such a thing? Well, in most instances, it's not about oil, nor is it about money or revenge, but it, it is about relief. It re, I'm sorry, it is about relief, rather. It's about reliefs, relief, belief, and religion. He's talking about a holy war. Dr. Redmer from the National Center for Disaster and Preparedness at Columbia University recently said this, the thought of holding your little child in your arms while it's dying is something that is catastrophic to even consider. But in the event of this kind of medical emergency, the hospitals are going to be overrun. The scientists are going to be racing to find some kind of a cure, some kind of a help. But look how long it's taken us to find relief for cancer. God said that in the last days there were going to be plagues. There were going to be diseases rampant and pandemic and we're on the verge of it now and we could become discouraged and we could uh, go into hiding we could go to some remote part of the world crawl in a hole and pull it in after us but that's not God's suggestion this gospel of the kingdom must go to the whole world we have a work to do and God has promised his children I'm going to keep you well while you do my job and so we're going to conclude now with some promises from God's Word. In Psalm 91, verse 10, God said, There shall no, you know it, help me, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, there we have God's promise, the sun shall arise, talking about Jesus and His second coming, the sun shall arise with healing in His wings. Revelation 21, verse 4, where we began a little bit ago. There God says, I shall wipe away every tear. And there'll be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death, for the former things have passed away. I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a pretty safe neighborhood. It's going to be a pretty healthful neighborhood when God comes to pitch His tent in our neighborhood. Don't you think so? And that's His promise. John said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And by the way, here's an interesting thought that came to me not so very long ago. I was asked to go to conduct a wedding this past summer. The bride I met a day or two before the wedding, and she was not the prettiest girl I had ever seen, and that may be being kind, Sweet and good, but not necessarily beautiful. But when she came walking down the aisle, beaming, looking at her husband-to-be, smile all across her face, I've got to tell you, that girl was transformed. I couldn't believe it was the same girl I'd met the day before at the practice. I mean, she was drop-dead gorgeous. I, in all of my years of marrying, have never met an ugly bride. And so John says, I saw the holy city. The new Jerusalem came down, prepared like a bride, ready to marry her husband. And then Jesus says, I'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And God our Father said, I'm going to build my tabernacle. I'm going to put my tabernacle in your neighborhood. And that, folks, is an allusion to the Old Testament times when a goat herder or a sheep herder would be out in the wilderness tending his sheep, out in the area where robbers and brigands and bad guys would come after dark and beat up on you and take all of your goodies. And so a man alone would see the fires of others who would congregate together for the purpose of safety and the enjoyment of fellowship and singing. And that's what God says. I'm going to, at the end of all things, put my house in the middle of your neighborhood. 
It's going to be a pretty safe place, isn't it? We're not going to have to worry about the thief or the robber or the rapist, and we're not going to have to worry about diseases, pandemics, plagues, or even the common cold. And so I say once again, hurry back, Lord Jesus. The Bible refers to our Lord as the great physician, the great healer, and I want him soon to come. Peggy and I, a few weeks ago, lost our middle child. Suddenly, no warning. It was the picture of health. But he had, in the 15 years prior to his death, been involved in about six automobile accidents. Two of them very, very serious. None of them his fault, by the way. This, by the way, is one of the reasons that I say to you folks every evening when we conclude, be sure to wear your seat belts. But one of the accidents that happened to my boy, his back was broken, and he had internal injuries, and he had uh, skull injuries, and he was bleeding about the face and the head, and the hospital called me and said, your son is dying. We prayed and begged God, and God spared his life for another 17 years. But he had such terrible pain. The back was broken, and the knee was shattered, and he had five or six surgeries. He had such terrible pain. And so Peggy and I, in the last few weeks, have found a longing for the great physician, for the healing father. No more disease, no more suffering, and no more sorrow. Please, Jesus, hurry. Let us pray. Please, Jesus, come back as soon as you can. In the interim, we have children and grandchildren and many other spouses that we love so much who are not ready. Make every appeal to their hearts. Don't give up on them, but at the same time, don't postpone your coming. In Jesus' name, amen.